Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Good evening and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney. And I'm Craig Freeman. October is observed nationally as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We take the opportunity tonight to examine not only that violent crime, but the issue of crime as a whole in Louisiana. Well, crime touches each of us either directly through personal loss and a heightened sense of fear, or indirectly through declining neighborhoods and more tax money spent on prisons. So how bad is the crime situation in Louisiana? And how do we compare to the rest of the country? And if we truly want to take a bite out of crime, where exactly do we need to start? Crime statistics in Louisiana reveal a disturbing pattern. While the country saw a 4% decline in overall crime from 2005 to 2007, the state's crime rate rose 12%. And despite an 8% drop in violent crime in Louisiana last year, nationally, New Orleans ranked first in murders per capita. While cities such as Shreveport and Lafayette saw their murder rate decline in 2008, Bossier City and Monroe saw increases. And Baton Rouge had 67 homicides last year. But by September of this year, the number was already at 58. I really don't feel safe. I really don't. Erica is a Baton Rouge resident. A recent murder in her neighborhood has her concerned for her family's safety. I'm, I'm going to move. I can't live like this. I really can't. Erica is not alone in her fear. 41% of respondents to a recent survey by the Baton Rouge Area Foundation's City Stats Project say they don't feel safe walking alone at night in their neighborhood. Nearly 60% say they're more concerned about crime than a year ago. Very few of the, uh, the people that we have as victims of violent crime in the city of Baton Rouge, very few of them do not have criminal records. Baton Rouge Chief of Police Jeff LaDuff acknowledges the city's spike in murders, but notes that most law-abiding citizens are not at risk. He attributes the recent uptick to two things drugs and guns. When you see uh, drugs in your community, the next thing is to have guns involved with that activity. And uh, people are just more likely to, to solve. There's no conflict resolution uh, in our younger generation. And uh, the way they solve conflict is simply by pulling a weapon and, and discharging that round. The Gulf Coast High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Task Force identifies cocaine and crack cocaine as the largest threat to Louisiana. Cocaine use contributed to 76 percent of violent crime and 62 percent of property crime in the task force's four-state region of Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Sociologist Matthew Lee is with LSU's Crime and Policy Evaluation Research Group. I think one of the problems that we have in some of our urban areas, and uh, everybody recognizes this, including the, the criminal justice authorities, is that the poor socioeconomic conditions often spawn um, illicit economies, um, drug markets. U.S. Census data places Louisiana's poverty rate of 17.3 percent, four points above the national average of 13 percent. Lee notes that the state's high rate of unemployment and school dropout further contribute to the problem. The, the real trick to, for sort of uh, the criminal justice system and basically the social service system is to figure out a way to um, provide uh, communities the tools that they need to maintain you know, a reasonable standard of living and uh, reduce the draw of participation in illegal markets. Domestic violence is another dangerous factor in the state's crime rate. President Obama touched on the issue at his recent town hall meeting in New Orleans. When it comes to domestic violence, oftentimes that's 
uh, underreported because women don't feel that they have the support they need uh, in order to step out from those situations. Louisiana had the dubious national distinction of having the most females murdered by males in 2008. This statistic is particularly troubling to Martha Forbes with the Capital Area Family Violence Intervention Center. Since the Department of Justice has been keeping statistics of the number of women killed by men, Louisiana has always ranked in the top five. And what it points out is that we must continue our work to develop safety nets in every community so that victims of domestic violence and other crimes against women are protected. Forbes points out that women face the greatest risk of assault when they leave their partner or threaten to report abuse to authorities. We must work together to talk about how violence and teaching violence as a potential solution of problems doesn't work. A recent summit hosted by the group 100 Black Men of Metropolitan Baton Rouge gave students an opportunity to do just that. Participants discussed ways to curb violence and truancy among teens. Their input will be incorporated into a media campaign targeting Baton Rouge's 56,000 young people. In Shreveport, a focus on the environment that breeds crime is having significant success, according to Police Chief Henry Whitehorn. The concept is that if you will allow uh, small nuisance crimes to manifest in, in certain neighborhoods, then the citizens begin to allow other things to happen. If you allow that broken window, then maybe you allow the trash in the street. If you allow the trash in the street, then maybe you allow the drug traffic to take place. Started in 2007, Operation Take Back Our Neighborhoods Every Day, or T-Bone, partners officers with property standards inspectors to more quickly address blight-related concerns. Residents are provided individual cell phone numbers for the officers and inspectors, which has fostered relationships that have reduced crime across the city. Overall, uh, for 2008, uh, we saw a reduction of about 14% overall in crime in Shreveport. Our violent crime was down uh, in double-digit numbers uh, and also our property crime. One large contributor to crime in Louisiana is the state's recidivism rate. While Louisiana has the highest incarceration rate in the country, nearly 50 percent of those released return to prison five years later. To address this, the state is expanding pre-release services provided to offenders before they leave jail. Issue, Department of Corrections Secretary Jimmy LeBlanc. And, and, and if we can reduce recidivism through this means, then we are enhancing public safety, re reducing crime victims, and having to build less prisons. Uh, and, and so saving money for the state and utilizing that money to, to, for our education and for the places where our state needs it. Caddo Correctional Center recently graduated its first class from the state's pilot program. Participants received GED opportunities, values development, job skills training, and substance abuse treatment prior to their release. I want people to understand that, that what we're doing is going to reduce crime. It's not being soft on crime. Ninety-five percent of the people that come to prison are coming home. You know, lock them up and throw away the key is the easiest thing to do, but they're coming home. And we're trying to do a, a better job of who's coming home. Well, joining me here in our LPB home is our studio audience. They include individuals from the Baton Rouge area who were randomly recruited and surveyed by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. We also have a member of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council and a student from the Anti-Violence Summit hosted by 100 Black Men of Baton Rouge that was mentioned earlier. Of those who responded to our survey question about party affiliation, 47 percent identify themselves as Democrat, 21 percent as Republican, and 26 percent as Independent or other. The majority of those surveyed, 74 percent, feel that there is more crime in their local community than a year ago. 13% felt that there is less. An equal percent don't know or are not sure. In terms of the amount of confidence in local law enforcement doing all they can to reduce crime, 42% have some confidence and 34% have a great deal. But 16% of respondents have not much confidence, while 8% have little or none. Despite high confidence levels, a total of 65% of respondents are very or somewhat worried about being the victim of a violent crime. 35% are not very or not at all worried. So let's start there. How worried are you about being a victim of violent crime? Do you think it's going to happen in your neighborhood? Do you think it'll happen to you? Joanna? Not at all. Not at all? Not worried a bit. I live in a, a, a nice neighborhood. I'm a school teacher. 
and um, I feel I feel safe. I really do. Okay, Everett, you agree? I think crime can go wherever, wherever people are. I don't think any neighborhood is immune. I think that uh, the the perpetrator of a crime will go where he sees the opportunity. With the economy moving the way it has, or you know, may move. Is that going to create more crime? Do you think that you know that we'll have more crime sooner because of of the economy, Thini? I do because people, like they said in the report, are stealing cars and things. And why would they steal that if we had a good economy where you can get an easy job and make some money? So it's getting worse. Yes. We're in trouble, I mean, we, we, Jeff. I think um, I think it's changing. I think robbery may be more of an issue with uh, the economy, but um, I feel like I hope we're making progress progress against the more violent crimes. So less violent crime, more crimes, just to personal property or, or things like that, but not people killing each other, can it? Yeah, oftentimes uh, personal crimes for and killing people. The suspects normally know each other, uh, you know, and they participate in the crime like in that in that manner. So we can reduce the violent crime, and we just have to worry about the robbery. I mean, shouldn't we be able to stop that too? I mean, can we get to a place where we don't have to worry about crime, Moa? I think uh, crime is always associated with a certain section of the society or community. Uh, no. That is very much. Uh, very much part of the uh, ec economics of, of that particular community. Social in inequities uh, can create those kind of problems. But especially, as you just touched upon, the economy, which is in recession, can create that kind of situation, but we may not be able to see that much increase because of that. So we can't ever solve this? I mean, I always have to worry about somebody breaking into my house? I always have to worry about somebody taking my stuff? Scott? Well, I think the thing that were brought out in statistics earlier, and I, I don't know the numbers, but uh, was that you know, the vast majority of the crime is, is fundamentally drug related, or uh, that you have both a large component of um, you know, theft that's, that's driven by that as well as violent crime, and that you, know, you, you have a fundamental problem that I think isn't that crime is a manifestation of, uh, of the underlying drug problem in the community. S so that you know, it makes me wonder if we eliminated the drug issue, would we eliminate a lot of the crime in our community? And you, you shake your head, yes. I think so. Really? I think, uh, as the report said, there's a certain percentage, I think it's 30 something percentage of the people incarcerated are directly from drug crimes, but then if you add burglaries um, that are driven by the need to get money to buy drugs, it's much greater. So what if we just legalized drugs and then we took away those, the bad things associated with it, right? I mean, you know, if you have to go to the pharmacy, then you don't have to go to the drug dealer. Wouldn't that solve all of these problems? Warren, you? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. <clears throat> uh, the kids, well, uh, they, they are not getting the going to get the education or whatever, and uh, they're trying to get the, the dollar quick or whatever. But I think uh, if law enforcement and the neighborhood could trust each other a little more, well, uh, we might could accomplish something. And w the, earlier they talked a little bit about more community policing. I is that the answer? You know, I, I, you hear stories of people knowing the police officer that walk the beat, but you don't really see that as much anymore. Is that no, the cure? They haven't mentioned that anymore. Uh, that was a top priority when uh, the mayor came into office, but you just don't hear anything about it anymore at all. And I think uh, the crux of a lot of crime is that uh, the, the public does not trust the police, especially the American, uh, African American. I mean, distrust of the police is an endemic in that population. Well, but if we can't trust the police, then how do we ever solve the, the problem, Andy? Well, uh, I, I think uh, a, a great deal of, of our problems are with young people when they are incarcerated. They have no, no recourse of getting a job because that record remains on their record. They go out to look for a job and as soon as they make an application, 
even if they tell a false that says I never was arrested or like, but when you work for a month or so, they still could tracking your record and they find that you do have a record they're gonna let you go so the relapse thing is the problem when they and, and it's the young people who are uneducated who when they are incarcerated they have no recourse and we need to look at giving them uh, expunging their record because the cost to expunge a record is tremendous and a poor person wouldn't have the funds to, to correct his ways, and that makes him go steal and kill and rob and go back to jail. And so if you're in jail, I mean, let me, let me ask a different way, would you hire an ex-cop? Can it? Uh, I think, like, it should be a, re a rehabilitation process to the point where they could come out, once they do that crime and they do the time to uh, access that crime, I think they should come out like a free citizen, but it kind, of, it kind of contradicts the First Amendment of freedom of speech because you really don't have no voice as far as in voting or getting a job. So it kind of contradicts, you don't have no voice. You're not really a human being. You know, you dehumanize. So, so what can we do to humanize people more when they get out of jail? Is there anything that we can do, Ashland, to help them move back into society? Personally, I think they should have some programs or anything just to help them rehabilitate and help them get education and everything so they can get back into society and function as a normal citizen. I see that uh, to, have, to be a retailer I'm dealing with a lot of younger kids uh, almost every day and I see some few people that like quit uh, drug and stuff like that very shortly go back to it. I saw few very very few that when uh, they quit the uh, drug and a stay, you know, depends the, if they find a job. Like I know this young man, he find a job in plant, he make it like $19 an hour. He completely quit. Recently he got married. You know, depends just like one, some of the people says, if they uh, get out of jail, he was in jail, he came out, you know, if they, uh, society or companies, wh whoever can help them to give him a job, definitely is a big help. Okay. Oh, you know, I'm dying. I'm a school teacher. If we educate the kids, when they're young, to be productive citizens. Not all, and I'm gonna say something that's gonna go across everybody's back the wrong way. Not all kids are, all kids are college material. If we train them to go into the workforce, to enter the workforce to be productive citizens, not, they will be much better off. Just like you just said, Allie. Yes. If they can come in and they can work and they have good work ethics and they're $19 an hour, $10 an hour, they'll be productive citizens. But if we think that they're all gonna go into college and become brain surgeons, we're, we're going the wrong way. So we gotta make so sure we, that we've got opportunity they've for got, They've everybody. got the, the skills that can allow them to enter the workforce. Ellen? I do have um, thoughts on that, uh, dealing with trying to reduce the residuum uh, rate uh, within the, this community here. And I do believe, as she said, with education, if there are programs, um, as far as them being able to learn a trade or a skill when they are incarcerated so that when they can come out um, they will be viable members of society and they can contribute I think that that is a great part of it however there has to be a coalition between business owners and um, you know the community as a whole to allow the people when they do get out to be able to gain employment because there's a stigma that's there so many business owners refuse to hire someone that does have a criminal background and just as um, the lady so eloquently put it that once it's found out we say have you been convicted of a felony you check no but if it's found out la later that you have well then well now you've you know, uh, perjured yourself because you've lied, you misrepresented the truth, so therefore you can, you're not trustworthy in that respect. And then if you do check yes, well, automatically I'm not going to hire you to begin with. So therefore you're left um, with possibly having gained a skill or trade while incarcerated, but you can't even apply that trade or skill once you've gotten out because of the stigma that society has against someone who's been incarcerated. So if there could be a coalition or maybe programs to um, try to do something to, to, to network so that individuals, when they can come out or when they do come out, they will have gainful employment. I think that'd be a great thing. Bill? I, I have to agree with everything that you said, and I think the key word that you, you said there was a network. <clears throat> and that, that means educating the public as to what we're dealing with. Uh, we need to educate the public that whenever people do come out of a program, 
that the public understands that these people have achieved something, have gotten their GED or gotten their training, and they have a second chance here. And if the employers of the area, if the people of the area understand that here's the rules and here's, here's what they've achieved, I think there's a better chance of them coming back into, into the community. No, in, I'm, I'm with you. We're talking about people getting out, but some people don't get out. I mean, we've got some tough laws in Louisiana that say, you know, once you go in, sometimes you're not allowed back out. Do we need to change those laws, or, or are we comfortable if you are a murderer or, you know, a, 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 vic, a, a, a perpetrator of a violent crime that you need to stay in jail for a long time? Derek? Uh, I think it might depend on the crime, uh, murder or, you know, some really violent crime like that I think uh, they need to pay for what they've done but uh, uh, maybe theft drug issues whatever they can possibly go into some type of rehabilitation program and get get on the right track well I, I know we've got some more to talk about but we're gonna get some people to help us answer some of these questions soon and so when we return we're gonna be joined by a panel of experts to further discuss crime in Louisiana Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. We're discussing crime in Louisiana. Joining us now is our panel of experts. James Buddy Caldwell was sworn in as Louisiana's 43rd Attorney General in January of last year. Prior to his election, Mr. Caldwell served for 29 years as a district attorney for East Carroll, Madison, and Tensaw parishes. In 2008, he was inducted into the Louisiana Justice Hall of Fame. Cecile Gouin has directed LSU's Office of Social Service Research and Development since 1996. Dr. Gouin develops programs aimed at interrupting the pathway to delinquency and crime. Additionally, she is an expert in truancy and court qualified in adult criminality and the development of criminal personality. Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Williams has worked with the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office for the past 21 years in various uniform patrol and detective positions. Lieutenant Colonel Williams developed the very first community-oriented policing program for the agency known as the Special Community Anti-Crime Team, or SCAT. Kevin Harrison is an assistant special agent in charge with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration's New Orleans Division. Mr. Harrison's area of responsibility includes Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Shreveport, and Monroe. Harrison presently serves on the Governor's Drug Control Policy Board. Let's go to our participants for their questions, and Betty, I think you had one to start us off. Yes, I must live in one of the few charmed neighborhoods that hasn't had a crime wave any time in the recent years. My concern is about people who are living in conditions that could persuade them to become criminals because they've become alienated and left out. <clears throat> a week ago, I was approached in the parking lot of the Albertsons on College Drive by a woman who said, my social security got cut off, my landlord cut me out, threw me out when I couldn't pay the rent. I didn't want to be on the streets at night, so I've been staying in the lobby of a, a nearby hospital's emergency room for the last two nights. They tried to put me in a homeless shelter, but the only homeless shelters that take women are full. There is one more place I could go, but they want $25 up front. So she was in the parking lot trying to panhandle $25 so she could get to the shelter. I gave her the money. Her story sounded too believable. I am terribly concerned that people who find themselves in the situation find one door after another slammed in their face, and their options pretty much are, sooner or later, they either result to crime or they become victims of crime. What can we do about this? A tough one to start us off. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to take the, the first pass? I think I was approached by the same woman. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> I found it's very common um, especially in Baton Rouge, they had to run a lot of panhandlers off from the intersections. You'd see them everywhere. Some of them were running them as businesses. A lot of people come to grocery stores, stay in the parking lot, come up with the same kind of stores. First thing you got to do is assume it's a scam and not, not believe it because what you're doing is perpetuating uh, criminal behavior if you do that. And you usually have a partner group of people who are doing it. Some people make a living by doing it and uh, make a lot of money. Now, I don't mean to bemean people who are in, in assessed to circumstances or people who are legitimately that way. The first thing I do is assume it's a scam. Um, a lot of these problems uh, 
a little more complicated than what they first appear. Maybe we can touch that later. I think that you have to be really, really careful in parking lots, especially if you're a woman, because I know a lot of women are abducted in parking lots. Uh, I'm like you when I'm approached by those people. Well, the first thing I do is I look around to make sure that they're not with someone else. There is a van parked somewhere nearby that somebody might pull me into, but I listen to what they say. And uh, about half the time I do give them the money just because um, I don't want to have to <laughs> leave and feel guilty about it. But a lot of times when they come with the story, I'll say, you know, I'll take you to get some gas. I'll follow you over to the gas station and get gas, or I'll call the homeless shelter and speak with them. I'm a social worker, so I know most of those places, and I'm happy to do it, um, but it, is, it is, can be a very dangerous situation in a parking lot, I really do believe. Lieutenant Colonel, is there any, I know the Sheriff's Office has a lot of, of, of programs to try and help with those kinds of issues. Uh, is this the, should you give to somebody that's got a Well, a you have to story? look at each case individually. Uh, as the uh, Attorney General stated, a lot of these people, that is their profession. They dress the part, they play up to you in order to get sympathy, to get funds to further some of the enterprise. You also have to be vigilant sometimes these people do work in conjunction with someone else to distract you to get your purse or go through it or whatever it may be uh, they it is a crime to panhandle and things of that nature putting them in jail isn't the solution we try to offer them as you uh, suggested trying to get them to a shelter or home or things of that nature but it's uh, it's not one entity that can solve the problem but the only thing we can stress to the public is be vigilant in what you do, your contact, protect yourself first, your valuables, and so on. And you just have to be careful of these people and the information you offer them. And Shirley, I know you had a, a, another question for us. Yes. Mr. Cardwell, do you think giving to and enabling them to beg for money in um, parking lots of grocery stores that they will be helping their their drug use or whatever because there are other like social services and there are many churches around who will give and help with their need. Well, <clears throat> the first thing I think that Ralph hit on was that you got to watch out for your own, your own safety or whoever it was that said it. And um, if you're approached at a drive through at McDonald's or Burger King, you're approached in a grocery store parking lot. Um, these people are watching. They're seeing what you look like, what kind of car you're getting into. They've watched you come out of the store. It's a profiling action, whether you want to call it that or not. So that's dangerous. That is a dangerous situation. A lot of them hang around convenience stores and gasoline places where people come in and out and where the people are so busy attending to the cash registers inside, they don't see them, and uh, they don't have the opportunity to run them off. So another thing you need to do is get on your cell phone and, and call the officers and report them and have them log it in at the radio uh, of the organization that uh, you call, whether it's the sheriff or the city police, your, your local agencies. And I, I'm saying this this is a dangerous thing. As a prosecutor, I've come from a small place where we know the people and we know who's doing it. It's just on a larger scale in a big city. The anonymity of people uh, in, a, in a big city means it's easier to do and it's easier to get away with. But if you think for a second people hadn't picked you out and sized you up, every one of us do it every day. We, you talked a little bit about communities and knowing what's going on in your community and earlier we, we uh, had some discussions about community policing. You know, are there things that we can all do to help eliminate some of these problems in our community? For chair for any of our panelists. Well, neighborhood watch. You know, people <coughs> took back over some of the neighborhoods. There were some people and some of the, When you start seeing bars in the windows, you got yourself a problem. And those people in those neighborhoods, regardless of where it is, what town, what region of the state, a lot of these folks have gotten together and taken back over their neighborhoods. And I heard somebody say uh, previously somewhere in, in here that a lot of it is drug related. I prosecute 
the murders, the rapes, and the armed robberies myself personally for 29 years. And I dealt with the juveniles, the adults, the school system. And um, our school teachers, number one indicator of juvenile delinquency, one of the most reliable indicators of juvenile delinquency is our school teachers. They can tell who's going to be a problem in school early on. And I don't know if we get that information anymore out of our schools. We more or less want to sue the teachers and the principals and everybody else in the school system and not support the school system. Holistic problem. We've got the problems everywhere. It's a complicated problem. Dr. Sheriff, with, with, with truancy or, or uh, you know, drugs, is there anything else? Well, with, uh, w when we're talking about communities and the network of communities and, and people helping people, I think what you're talking about with children in the schools is critically important. Uh, we developed a truancy program of our, out of our office about 10 years ago uh, with the help of the Louisiana Legislature and Senator Ulo from Jefferson Parish. And it's now in about 24 parishes in Louisiana, and it's for K through fifth grade children. And what it requires, it, it's kind of a different program, it's very flexible funding, but what it requires is, you know, is little bureaucratic hassle for the school teacher to report that something is wrong with the young child. You know, that they're either truant, at, you know, they're either not there after five days, they have five absences, or they're at risk for truancy. They see them sleeping or wearing you know, dirty clothes or homeless type behavior, and and uh, and then the the task take the truancy caseworkers work with the child and the family, and the family to help solve the problem. They don't just deal with it in a punitive manner. And I think you've seen in our own community here that uh, when the district attorney, new district attorney, came into office, one of the first things that he decided to do was was try to deal with the truancy problem because he knew the relationship between truancy and crime. And I know the relationship between truancy and crime just because of the work I've done with children that have been in the Louisiana uh, prison system, juvenile prison system. And he, he, you know, he said, you've got to connect the dots. If, if you're not in school early and, and you can't succeed at school, your chance of becoming a criminal is unbelievably increased. And our teacher had some questions for us too, Joanne. Well, and mine's unrelated to that, but you're you're exactly right. Truancy, I you can see that that correlation, and it's it's very obvious. Now, my question was about homeowners and the neighborhood watch. You just mentioned that a few minutes ago. Why should we pay additional fees and fun, and fees for homeowners um, or neighborhood watches? Um, our, I, I, and, I, and I'm not, I'm being, I'm not, not trying to be ugly, right. but I pay my taxes, or my husband pays our taxes for us every year on a regular basis, and our neighborhood is saying, let's pay an extra $300 so we have an extra security in there. Now, I'm, I'm the maverick in this group, I'm sure. I don't believe in, I think if our door is unlocked, you're welcome to come in. I really believe that. If someone breaks down, they can come in the house and use the phone, because that's how I feel. But our neighborhood, they want us to pay extra money for extra security, and I don't believe, I don't think we should. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> everyone pays for law enforcement through taxes and right. other means of that thing. The situation with neighborhood watches and communities who choose to hire off-duty deputies or police officers or whatever, is a comfort level that they choose. We can't be everywhere at once. So what that gives them is that affordability of having a deputy or an officer that is in that neighborhood. He doesn't go, he or she doesn't go anywhere else. They stay in patrol in that neighborhood and pretty much address the concerns of the people who are it's paying them for that. It's a visual, more yes. or less, yes. right? You've got someone, like I said, if you're paying them eight hours a day or six hours a day, you're going to see that unit because that's the only area that they have to patrol. Regular deputies, we may get a call in that neighborhood. We have to leave. We have to go to other assignments and things of that nature. So what you're paying for is to have someone there full time to make sure that your property is protected and that you have someone there on a regular basis. So I'm ideal idealistic, right? <laughs> Jeff. Um, I have a different question. Uh, <coughs> I heard recently that Baton Rouge was rated like the 12th worst metropolitan area in the country. And it just 
doesn't feel like that to me. I've lived in a number of cities and I don't think we're anywhere near number 12. So what can we do to help people believe and, and other rating agencies uh, come up with the fact that we're not that bad? And maybe uh, uh, Agent Harrison, I, I know there was also a uh, um, uh, police chief Leduff talked about drugs and that, that being a factor for at least some of the violent crime and then uh, the other panelists talk a little bit more about what we can do to... I think I may have seen the same thing you did and it was obviously a Forbes uh, generated yeah, uh, statistic which obviously has a business uh, underpinnings to it which would represent that uh, it discourages businesses mm -hmm. from possibly developing in this area due to the fact that the, we're the 12th uh, highest crime rated area. Uh, but then the uh, if I remember correctly, the follow-up to that was the Chamber of Commerce did their own polling that suggested that crime was not even in their top ten concerns as it related to recruiting businesses. Uh, from a drug perspective, uh, obviously, and the, uh, the Attorney General hit on it earlier when you, when you talked about these years of prosecution, uh, I, I, when people ask about is it is it a particular crime drug-related, uh, it's hard to quantify that. And only from the, only from the uh, perspective that uh, a lot of crimes are drug related in that a large, large percentage of the people upon arrest, if, if they have to submit to a urinalysis or any kind of sampling as it relates to uh, blood or something like that, will have some sort of uh, intoxicant in their system, whether or not it's alcohol, whether or not it's, it's uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, whatever it might be. So would they have committed that crime if that particular drug wasn't <clears throat> in them? So that represents that, yeah, that's drug related. From my perspective, uh, drug-related crimes that I identify with are one dealer ripped off another one, somebody shorted somebody on a, on a dope deal and so they robbed them, or somebody just flat out robbed them straight up because uh, uh, it was a target of convenience and, uh, and took their money. Uh, are these, if these statistics are captured, uh, it's, it's difficult to say because those crimes go uh, unreported uh, more often than not until such a time as it gets violent and then, uh, and then the crime becomes, the attached crime uh, doesn't become a drug related crime, it becomes the robbery related crime. So it's, it's hard to quantify those <coughs> kinds of things, but uh, I, saw, I, I did see that. And I'm trying to, I know we've got a couple more questions, but it, from an image standpoint, is there anything that we can do to let people around the country know that maybe we're not as bad as the magazine said? Well, the truth is the truth. Um, what I think is, is that I don't think Baton Rouge is any worse than anybody else in the country, and I say that if you, depends on what areas of a city that uh, they're taking their statistics from, usually you're going to have a high crime area in nearly every big city in the United States. It's going to be rare that you don't have that, so the numbers reflect while well, we got the most people in prison in the United States, yes, we're going to have more. Uh, people who are going to recommit crimes, you're going to find a lot of those or most of those are uh, recidivist crimes. So I don't think that's correct at all. I think everybody ought to be happy. If, if you hadn't been the victim of a crime, if you look and you see most of the victims of crimes are in areas where you see the bars in the windows, as I said a while ago, or where you have poor um, uh, visuals in a neighborhood, run-down houses, dope dealers like to hang out on street corners where there are a lot of beer, beer cans on the sidewalk and garbage cans, you know, because, or outside of busy little dump places where nobody else wants to go and people come up and pick up their drugs very cheaply for $20 and buy three or four rocks of crack cocaine. And in high intensity meth, places where they can pick up meth, uh, crack cocaine, those are the worst thing. And some of the most important things are what we don't say to our kids. Some of these most important things, maybe we can get into this a little bit later, but what we don't tell our kids uh, what not to take and what not to get on is extremely important, I think, and has accelerated exponentially the crime that I've seen. And I've looked at it ground level from the whole system, from the school, from the drugs, being a coach and a teacher <coughs> myself, and going through the whole system. But, you, but you, you still cannot deny the truth 
that for many, many years, as long as I've been looking at, at statistics and, and demographics, that Louisiana has always had the highest incarceration rate. Some years we might be number two. Right after Katrina, we were down a little. We have been the most dangerous state since they've been collecting that statistic for many years. And then you have to think that it's got to have something to do with the fact that we have the highest poverty rate, we have the highest percentage of children living in poverty, we have the highest percentage of single female headed households in the family, I mean in the state, in, in the country. And so it, you have to connect the dots between poverty and our incarceration rate. I mean, you just have to. It, there, there's no other explanation for it. And I feel very safe in my home, too. I mean, I lived in another part of the state when I moved here. I thought, this is great. You know, you can walk your dogs at midnight. You can, mm -hmm. you know, really. I mean, I, I have always felt very safe here. But the facts are is that we do have the highest crime rate in the country. We have the highest murder rate. I mean, we do. Maude. Yes. Uh, I think the, the crimes related to drugs is very, it's a very complex problem. Um, we have been talking about it. We are establishing that fact that it is there. But as far as solutions are concerned, that's where my question is going to. Um, some of the industrialized nations, like Netherlands, mm -hmm. legalize drugs. Mm -hmm. And their percentage of crime there mm -hmm. is much lesser than uh, in, in this country, as a country, United mm -hmm. States. Uh, is there any correlation with uh, I mean, if, you, if you if you do that, if you legalize some of them, mm -hmm. Can we see some reduction in crime? You know, obviously, the legalization issue is, a, is an issue that I don't know that a drug enforcement person <laughs> should address as much as uh, someone that's uh, more concerned about the sociological effects of it. Uh, uh, I'm about crime and punishment. Uh, however, in talking about your, uh, uh, the Netherlands and looking at the incident in the Netherlands, the grand experiment still represents that although, y and you're representing to me that there's less uh, personal uh, crimes against people, the, uh, the highest rate of addiction is now occurring in the Netherlands uh, that involves heroin and stronger uh, drugs than any other place on earth. Mm -hmm. And they have come to the realization that maybe that wasn't as good an idea as they thought it was. Obviously, in the, in the news recently, uh, we're all being exposed to the uh, medical marijuana uh, situation that goes on in California. And uh, uh, we received uh, the Attorney General's opinion uh, yesterday as it relates to our enforcement efforts and quite frankly they haven't changed any. Uh, our enforcement efforts on a federal uh, level will still be to target the highest level of traffickers uh, that we've always done and if there are people engaged in that business out there simply go ahead and make money at it or to prey upon the, uh, uh, the misfortunes of others uh, we will continue to target those people. The legalization of drugs, I don't know that, I don't know that any society uh, wants to unleash uh, one more vice, one more uh, addiction uh, on any society. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, can it be done? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that we want to take that, that chance or that risk. I mean, I just don't know. I think that's the worst possible thing we can do. Uh, we got legal drugs. We got prescription drugs now. We got drugs that people start with the back hurting and can't get off of. I mean, everybody loves coffee. I love to have my morning coffee. I'm sure half the people here do. But we have drugs that are legal now that people are hooked on, and we see more and more of the prescription drugs being, being sold, taken out of the cabinet. So you're, um, here's what I see and what I have seen is a very complicated, holistic problem we got, and you got to go solve each little problem separately and cumulatively to have any effect at all. This is not one little one size fits all here. Cocaine and crack cocaine. I've seen, if I got mad at the last attorney general in Washington and I said some stuff I probably shouldn't have said, now why in the world are you letting, telling people that those who get on crack cocaine, one of the worst drugs we got, it's the same drug as powdered cocaine. But powdered cocaine you can get off of. You can get off of that drug, but you cannot get off of crack cocaine. And the people who use powdered cocaine are not nearly as angry and as bad, and the addictive nature of crack cocaine and crystal meth are horrible. So the drug dealers who are causing the problems and who are, there's no room in the local jails for them, so you got to let the drug dealers back out on the street, and they're creating five to six criminals a piece a week for life. 
That's where the problem's coming from. And these are the people that I try for murder, for rape, for armed robbery. I have mothers giving away five and six-year-old children to get crack cocaine from their boyfriend. I have pe people killing each other over a dollar or two dollars or trying to get uh, crack and drugs out of the bedroom. And, and their lives are ruined and are spent at an amazing rate and the system can't handle it. It's a systemic problem as well, not having enough, not enough local jail space and creating this tremendous number of criminals every week by every dope dealer that sits out there. So if the kids in the schools don't get on crack, don't get on crystal meth, if you got it in marijuana, you're going to be worthless. Marijuana, oh, there's a, they're, they're not bored by marijuana. If they go drink, they're going to get drunk and throw up. But we don't say that to kids. A kid, don't, no matter what you do, don't do heroin, don't do crystal meth, don't do crack. You gotta try something, try something else. Don't try those. And we need to be honest about this. Well, and that's my problem. I want to follow up to your question, especially as it relates to the legalization thing. Uh, so many times, uh, uh, what I consider to be a fraud that's being perpetrated on, on, on the public is that we're filling our jails up with people for possession of certain drugs. Possession. Uh, that's not true. And I mean, uh, those of you who have probably had some exposure to someone who has gone to jail for a drug-related crime or has been involved in some sort of drug-related situation, they're not in jail for the possession. They may have got it pled down to a possession charge, but they're probably in jail for a quantity that represented a distribution amount. They were probably engaged in activity and a result, as a result of a plea bargain and, and, and the statistic being captured that way, then that's what gets represented to the public that they're in jail for a, a possession. I know, Bill, you had a question. I did. Um, Especially since 9-11, uh, it seems like there's uh, some urgency in seeing uh, networking or communication between different uh, agencies. Uh, from each of your perspectives, uh, do you see the level of, uh, of communication with other agencies? And uh, each of you represent a very different perspective of, I think, very fine organizations, but do you see the, the communication that you need from, from your office with people that you need to relate well, to? <clears throat> I can tell you coming from a small rural area where we had a lot of drug dealers and a lot of people with guns. You know, I've, I killed my first deer when I was seven years old. I had to learn how to shoot a gun. I'd, my daddy wouldn't give us bullets if we couldn't hit anything. So we had to first learn how to shoot a gun. Before I could, do, before I could drive, I could shoot a gun. Um, with the agencies that we have worked with and after 9-11, the communication has definitely improved. And let me tell you one place that's really helped. Like out in the rural, a lot of city people go hide in the rural, go get the guns from the uh, rural area. One, uh, one thing is your local juries is, is, is an issue. Sometimes we're better off in the federal system. So we'll ask the local uh, DAs would ask our federal authorities, if we have a big drug dealer back in a small community where we don't think we can pick a jury and convict them, are they giving people a lot of money, things in the community, we'll ask the federal people to get them on a firearms possession charge, put them in federal court and let the feds get them. So that cooperation has been extensive. I've worked with DEA. Uh, we've done undercover work, you know, but we'll work for eight, ten months and put 18 people to take us you know, 18, 20 months, and we, we're getting 20, 25 people and putting them in jail. We've got to turn them all loose that night because the jail's full with murders, armed robbers, and aggravated rapists. So local jail space is what moves the system. People got to sit in there in that jail until they get tried if we can get them moved through the system. We've got plenty of local jail space. They'll plead guilty. Yes, they're going to get out and commit more crimes. Uh, so we're going to see them again anyway, but at least we move the cases through the system and the people in the street, it is a deterrent because accountability is another thing I hadn't heard anybody say anything about. People who are not accountable. We Before we talk about accountability, let's at least talk a little bit with the sheriff about some local uh, interaction with uh, other agencies. Uh, just with the panel you have here, uh, I have members with uh, DEA that work with that group closely. We have members with the AG's task force office that deals with sex crimes and things of that nature, uh, Sheriff Gotro this year has become the
the chief uh, of the Delta Narcotics Task Force, which is uh, a task force that deals primarily in narcotics, high-profile crimes, but it involves West Feliciana Parish Sheriff's Office, Point Capi Parish Sheriff's Office, the Constable's Office here in Baton Rouge, the City of Bacon, the City of Zachary. So in this point in time, in this day and age, if you're not networking with each other, yeah. I mean, your head is in the sand. You've got to communicate not only to eliminate duplication of services, but be more efficient with the manpower you have. Bill, obviously on a global, on a global scale, uh, some of the things that have changed post 9-11 are uh, impacting uh, uh, people who are engaged in that type of activity by seizing their, their funds, their assets, uh, because that's really where you uh, take away their ability to go ahead and function as any kind of an organization. Uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration has been actively involved in this for years in South America and, uh, and other countries. We are now represented in Afghanistan, uh, working hand in glove with the Department of Defense and the military uh, in dealing with the, uh, uh, obviously the poppy uh, that is located there and, and doing what we can to eradicate uh, that situation there. But uh, every day uh, you can pick up the newspaper uh, here in Baton Rouge and you'll see where the efforts that we do collectively uh, on the interstates, this corridor that we have that runs through the state of Louisiana, I-10, uh, is, is just a, a thoroughfare for uh, uh, drugs, guns, uh, stolen vehicles, and um, uh, more importantly, the money that uh, uh, underwrites uh, the activities of people who would engage in, uh, in doing harm to this country. So we feel like we make an impact there as well. Can I? I feel as though, like, if you want to eliminate a problem, you have to go to the source. And 100 grams of cocaine is still equivalent to five grams of crack cocaine, like rock or whatnot. You still have to, like, cut off that trafficker or whoever it may be that eliminates the small fish in the pond. You don't even have to encounter those people going to jail if you eliminate that person that's trafficking all the heavy uh, cocaine or whatnot. I, they eliminate I, some major But I mean, listen problem. to what we're talking about. We're talking about crime in Louisiana. And so we're talking about incarceration, you know, stopping the people that are running drugs to the state. And we have to do all that. But if we're really going to stop crime in Louisiana, we're going to have to start much earlier. I mean, what you have to do is prevent people from becoming criminals. We are losing the incarceration war. We've lost. Right now, we've chosen in our state, as well as many other states, to pay for incarceration as opposed to pay for higher education. That's what we're doing. Now, when he asked about communication, I was sitting, uh, what I was thinking was, oh, God, this is great, you know, because this wonderful thing has happened in East Baton Rouge Parish where the sheriff, the DA, uh, the mayor, Somebody else, I don't remember who the other, uh, I guess the school board superintendent, chief of police, chief of police yeah. are all communicating on a level I've never seen before yeah. about doing something about the truancy problem. You know, not because they're school officials, but because they're law enforcement officials and they feel like that's a responsible thing to do. And, and so when they communicate about preventing crime, uh, and you, uh, I think when you saw, um, Earlier, we talked about Secretary LeBlanc with the Department of Corrections where he's talking about preventing crime and preventing people from coming back to prison. That's the only way we're going to make. I mean, I've watched statistics for 25 years uh, and, and dealt with young children that have grown up to become criminals and with the children of the criminals that y'all are talking about. And I know we have to do that. I mean, probably more than most people, but uh, I, we have got to really focus on prevention I and mean, we've got to do it. And when, unfortunately, we're also losing the battle of time. And so uh, we've got more that we need to talk about. I know I knew there were a couple of questions here. Um, the good news is we can also always join online and ask some of these questions. And I know we'll be able to get some responses online. But we want to thank our panelists, Mr. Caldwell, Dr. Gillen, uh, Colonel Williams, and Mr. Harrison. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments.
Well, a very complex, multi-dimensional problem that we have to address on many different levels. It so. is, and we had some great experts, and we had some great conversation, but we need to talk more about this. And so, thankfully, online, we can talk more and, and expand this conversation a little bit. Well, we certainly want to hear of what uh, you think about this topic. And uh, this, you know, we were I was broken in my house several times. It's not an academic exercise, and I think a lot of people are worried uh, personally about violent crime. And I'm happy to see the DAs across the state are really worrying working with sheriffs about truancy. Exactly. I think that's so important. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We invite you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square to take this month's survey. Sign up to follow us on Twitter or tell us what concerns you about crime in Louisiana. We want to hear from you like we did from Keith, who wrote us following last month's show on health care reform. Keith writes, funding is what is needed unfunded mandates are not, and tort reform is not all it's cracked up to be. Well, thank you, Keith, for commenting. You can continue to track the latest development in health care legislation every Friday on Louisiana the State we're in. As our state attempts to move its economy towards higher growth, high-tech industries, how prepared is it to meet the challenge? Join us in November as we explore technology in Louisiana. Thanks for watching, and good night. Good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.